Yeah, it's it's really a, a pleasure today to to, to welcome um, Sarah Spalding um, to to our Diatom Web Academy. Um, I've I was thinking back to when I first met Sarah, and we were both students, and I think it was almost thirty years ago, Sarah. <laughs> So we haven't changed at all in that time. So, um, but Sarah is an ecologist with the USGS based out of the University of Colorado, where she's also a fellow at the uh, at INSTAR there. Um, most of us know Sarah for uh, a number of the things that she's helping with uh, for all of us, all of us diatom folks. Um, she's a member of our, our taxonomic certification committee of of the SFS, which uh, hosts and sponsors this Diatom Web Academy. And she's also been really the leadership behind development of first DOTUS, Diatoms of the United States, and, and secondly, our, our, uh, our new Diatoms of North America, um, which is a real powerful tool that I think all of us have, have come, to, come to know and love. And it's also where we host and and back up and archive and announce all of the uh, the upcoming diatom webinars. So with that, Sarah, thanks again for uh, uh, offering to give a webinar today, and we're looking forward to your talk. Great, thank you, Mark, and thanks for everyone. And I'm delighted to give this presentation today to talk about some of the work that we've been doing in my lab. And it really starts off that we've been doing a lot over the past few years to um, make assessment better, to develop tools like uh, diatoms.org, to de develop taxonomic resources and um, ways that we develop voucher floras and verify the work that we do. And today I'm going to talk about um, Another part of that work, how we look at the composition of diatoms assemblage, assemblages, and how do we measure assemblages for assessment? Oh, how do I make this flip? Okay. So um, the problem is that the composition of diatom assemblages, communities in rivers and lakes, can tell us about the condition, and that is the health or the biotic integrity of freshwaters. And one method in particular, the fixed count method, has become firmly established for the means to measure diatom assembly, a composition. So, um, but we started asking questions about that method and wanted to look into it a little further and found that alternative methods may produce more information and powerful results at a lower cost. So all of the work that I'm talking about today um, is, uh, stems from uh, the work that Meredith Tyree did, which is um, included in this publication um, list here and also available um, on the, the Diatom Academy website. So one of the limitations to the application of diatoms in biological assessment is a dependence on a small number of skilled taxonomists, as well as a seasonally high demand to complete sample analysis. So an experienced person takes about two to three and a half hours to complete what we call a fixed count analysis of 600 valves for each sample. And some samples can require up to eight hours. So we've got a shortage of the people that can do this work and the time demands that are on them. And so there are typically long, really long turnaround times in getting samples back from labs on the order of years. So if there's an enumeration method that's faster, provides estimate of the dominant taxa, and improves characteristics of species richness, 
that method would offer an improvement over what we're currently doing. Uh, furthermore, we need to be confident that our protocols are directed at obtaining the data that we need, <laughs> the data that we need to do the assessment in a cost-effective manner. And so I'd like to get to um, kind of the structure of biotic assemblages. And all communities, whether it's beetles or grasses or seaweeds or diatoms, are, have similarities in their structure. And that similarity is that some species are very abundant, others are only moderately common, and the remainder, often the majority of species are rare. And this species distribution um, is you know, one of the hallmarks of biology. These species distributions follow a characteristic um, log normal curve in which most species have few representatives. So over here, we've got the dominant species there's there's only uh, a few that are dominant and rare species lots of them okay so and typically these rare species are not very well characterized and they're also often removed from um, bioassessment data and lake sediment data, all kinds of data, the rare taxa are omitted. And why is that? It's that rare species are perceived as adding noise and obscuring the relationships between environmental stress and biological communities. But noise might result from improperly characterizing that, um, that rare species tail um, rather than from rare species lacking a clear environmental response to stress. So um, how are diatom samples analyzed for species composition? In early studies examining the effects of pollutants on rivers by Ruth Patrick here, our, our hero, um, Ruth Patrick in, in the field, um, did the pioneering work on looking at the composition of biotic assemblages, um, including diatoms. And, and uh, Dr. Patrick found that fixed counts of 3,000 to 8,000 valves were to be the standard, that that's what you needed to, to characterize the, 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 the species within an assemblage. Uh, later on, a lower number of valves, people said, well, you know, maybe 300 to 600 is okay, um, you know, adequate, that'll do. And there's been an various endpoints that have been used in large surveys. Um, a fixed count of 300 by the European um, Union Water Framework directed, um, of 500 in EPA's Western EMAP, um, 600 by the NRSA uh, survey and 600 by the USGS National Water Quality Assessment. So based on what though? What, what, where do those numbers come from and how do we know? There's really the, no clear rationale for a meaningful total number of diatom valves to characterize an assemblage based on a fixed count. And the 300 to 600 endpoint appears to have originated for the purpose of characterizing the dominant taxa in the community. So, in regardless of the endpoint, it's often assumed that the fixed count method 
is a means to standardize effort across samples. But standardization can be incomplete and thus it can be a bit deceptive. And so I hope to ex explain to you why I say that in this uh, case study of um, 68 reference sites and 20 test sites along an urban gradient. So these um, sites came out of the USGS Southeast Regional Assessment and um, as part of Meredith Tyree's uh, master's work, she wanted to build up this large study of reference sites. There really were not enough within the Southeast study. So we obtained samples on loan from, that were archived in the academy from previous National Water Quality Assessment Program and also from EPA's National um, Rivers and Streams Assessment. All of these analyses were conducted based on a voucher flora of southeastern rivers. And so first, we examined the composition of diatoms in 15 you know, sort of test sites using a 600 valve fixed count. So each one of these curves represents the mean of five sites. Five of the sites had low species richness. Five of them had medium, and we we're just kind of putting these in these bins. And five, and five of them had high species richness. And so we've, here we've got valves counted. We counted 600 in each of these groups and then um, calculated the enumeration efficiency. So uh, enumeration efficiency is an estimate of the probability that additional taxa will not be encountered with further examination. So if you were to really, what Ruth Patrick was doing was really capturing almost all of the community, this, this complete, you know, a measure of one being um, uh, uh, capturing all the individuals that are expected within a community. And as you can see, a 600 valve count, although that's, we set that as being a way to standardize effort, we can see that depending on the type of community that it is, if it's a low richness site, it does a pretty good job, a fixed count does a pretty good job at capturing most of the taxa that are present. But if it's a, a, a site with a large number of species, um, it's, it captures maybe 85%, has an efficiency of 85%. And there's a lot of species that are not being captured that we would have to count up to 3,500 valves in order to get them. So, um, so we looked at, well, you know, how would be a way to, um, this fixed count um, is not representing, the, the, the assemblage is not being represented equally. So, um, Next, we spent a lot of time actually considered alternative methods to estimate composition in order to, you know, what are other ways that we could, you know, more completely capture an assemblage. And so um, we use a stratified count method um, in which we record stage coordinates then identify and enumerate valves along a transect until you get to the 50 of the most common taxa. And then you stop, record the stage coordinates, and then continue to ID and count all valves except that first taxon. 
and then you repeat it and you successively omit species until um, for each taxon to get to 50 until you reach a total of 600 valves. So it, it sounds a little, it's a little weird, but it's a way to um, capture the rare taxa. And um, we compared that then to something which we call the timed presence method, which was to identify and enumerate the first 100 observed values. And this is really you know, what we thought of as being an abbreviated fixed count, which will characterize the dominant taxa. Stop, and then set a timer and identify additional species present on a slide for a period of one hour and record those species like Gophenema louisianum, but not enumerate them. And some people might be very familiar, familiar, familiar with this as being a large rare count, um, which was done by folks in the academy for some time of doing some sort of fixed count and then looking for things that are large and are rare after that. So the time presence method is kind of a, a variation on that, uh, what's been called a large rare count. So when we compared those 15 test samples, um, each one of these uh, numbers is a site and the number of taxa that was found um, first by the fixed count and then by a stratified count and then by a timed presence count. And they're, so they're sort of ordered by number of taxa or um, species richness. So um, what you can see from these plots is that the fixed count method in nearly all of these samples, not all, but um, nearly all, had the lowest species richness. It detected all, about only 10 to 30 percent of the taxa detected by the other two methods. And then I'll talk about this one. The time presence method detected the greatest number of taxa at most sites, these, these dark bars. But the stratified count method detected the greatest species richness at nearly all the sites. So that was really the best method at me measuring richness and had the greatest enumeration efficiency of all the methods um, because we could sort of use this to count to an, you know, an endpoint of efficiency. So we could say this one is the best, the stratified, right? So then we looked at what this method did um, or in terms of time and also in terms of money. So the fixed count is two to three hours. These are for these test slides, up to eight hours for a fixed count. Um, a timed presence was one to two hours and up to three. But this stratified count was really variable that in low species sites, it's actually really hard to get up to that 50 taxa to move on. And so it can take a really long time in the low richness sites. Um, it's kind of okay in the high richness sites. So we made a compromise here is that the time presence method estimated species richness better and required less time. And so we adopted this time preference method to apply to this larger data set of 68 reference sites and 20 test sites um, following that approach. So how did we evaluate the results? 
we looked at them in a few ways. And the first way was in terms of metrics. So uh, we evaluated the results of the time presence and fixed count by the ability to discriminate between a reference site and a test site. And so how do they compare in terms of metrics? So here is a, a list of, of metrics and um, the results for the fixed count and time presence. And I've highlighted here in yellow the um, results that are significant. That is that, um, that these um, p-values are significant in determining a difference between a reference and a test site. So a reference meaning uh, as defined by a least impacted site and a test site is, I didn't explain that very well, a test site is one of the sites that is um, along an urban gradient from uh, low impact to highly urbanized sites. And so we can see that um, the timed presence did not, was not effective in terms of metrics for determining fresh versus brackish taxa, whereas the fixed count uh, was. Um, but in say uh, nitrogen fixate, fixing taxa, the fixed count was not effective, but the time presence was. So they're, 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 it's about equal in terms of um, being able to distinguish sites based on metrics calculated from these two different approaches of analyzing the same uh, slides. The next way that we evaluated the results was in terms of taxonomic completeness. And taxonomic completeness is defined as the proportion of taxa observed, or O, in a sample compared to the taxa expected, E, under reference conditions. Um, I'll come back to that in a, a little more next. And just when we look at the number of taxa for these 68 reference sites, the fixed counts of 600 are on the left and the time presence count are on the right. So the time presence is um, detecting significantly more species, species um, than this, the fixed count method. And when we put that into what we call an, this measure of taxonomic completeness, observed over expected indices. Now these are derived from um, what's called river invertebrate prediction and classification system, RIVPAX type models, which are widely used um, for macro invertebrates for assessment. They have not been successful for diatoms. They require uh, an accurate and a precise estimate of taxonomic composition to predict uh, taxon occurrence in reference sites. And so there have been some publications um, by Carlisle and Ritz on developing a diatom over E model and they have not been successful. And if anyone here was in some of the previous talks, Susie Thoreau from uh, California, the California state um, O over E model for diatoms was also not considered to, um, successful. So how did it turn out here? We constructed genus level models and species level models from both the fixed count and the time presence method to produce 
four O over E indices, um, with only one of them being a successful model. And I'm going to go through some of these, how we determine whether it's a successful model. So um, observed over expected. So if the observed taxa are equal, if are equal to what we expect in a site, we get a score of one. And so that is a measure of accuracy. And so for each of these uh, models, a fixed count method based on species, a timed presence model based on species, or a fixed count method based on just genus level designation, or a time presence um, count, oops, I blew that. <laughs> Which one? No, no, that's right. Okay, <laughs> the time presence based on genus. Okay, they're all okay in terms of accuracy. That's pretty good. They're just within um, 0.03 of being one. So um, good. Precision is determined by the standard deviation of the model. So the upper bound is the replicate standard deviation, and the lower bound is the standard deviation of a null model. And um, the fixed count species is the, the poorest precision, but these others have very good precision. They, they are precise models. Um, the sensitivity of the model is determined by correlation with stressors. So you have this model that's um, accurate and precise, but is it actually sensitive to the things that you need it to be sensitive to? Um, and in this study of uh, an urban gradient, we looked at the percent impervious surface as a measure of urbanization. So road surface, parking lots, asphalt, and, um, and the only one of these models that was, had a uh, relationship to urbanization was the timed presence model at the species level. And that sensitivity is actually pretty good to have a R value of 0.4. Um, None of the others, um, the fixed count with a, of a species level, a fixed count at the genus level, the time presence at the genus level had really any relationship to um, urbanization. And so this amount of, of impervious surface is a measure of disturbance or stress. Um, it's a continuous variable. variable and it's typically correlated with uh, stream degradation, alteration of biodiversity, and species loss. And so we uh, concluded that this time present model is accurate, precise, and most importantly, uh, sensitive. Sorry, Sylvia. <laughs> What about that analyst who takes frequent coffee breaks? How are we going to, going to standardize this? So if we're saying we're going to count for one hour, and this came out, um, Meredith presented this work in a poster at the International uh, Diatom Symposium in Berlin a couple of years ago. And um, Maria Callert came up and asked this question exactly of, what about that person that drinks so much coffee? So um, Meredith went back to these models and said, okay, what if, um, what if we start removing species at random? Um, you know, this is, you know, so representing none, up to taking out 20%, whether it's a low, richness site or a high richness site, you remove those species because that person missed them because they were sitting on the couch drinking coffee. What does that do to the model, 
to the accuracy, sensitivity, or the accuracy, the precision, and the sensitivity. And we can see that the it still is sensitive, but we start dropping off really markedly at 20% of species removed. So I don't know if that means 20% of your time drink, drinking coffee, <laughs> but there's, there's some, we need to kind of figure that out. Like how, you know, does it doesn't mean that we actually look a little more, um, you know, bump it up to what's the standard um, um, in order to make sure that we capture that and keep the sensitivity of the model. Um, and then finally, um, a novel outcome of this work was that we could detect species loss from urbanization. And this is really a big deal. And I'm really excited about this because the O over E model allows us to document loss of biodiversity. When you construct that model, you can see the species that are not, that are expected to be there, but they're not. And they're not there um, because of this disturbance. And this is, so in these urban streams, these taxa disappeared with urbanization. And this is a uh, potentially a really powerful tool for assessment um, because diatoms are uh, identified to the species level, we can determine this loss of biodiversity. And this has not been uh, usable within macro invertebrate over E models, even though those are widespread and used because most of those, nearly all of them, I believe, they're constructed at the genus level. And so you can't really, it, it's really rare. You, you, you can't really talk about loss of a, of a genus. Um, and so they fail to have this ability um, to detect species loss. And this could tell us about, you know, species that are endangered and um, uh, from human impacts. So um, in terms of metrics, the timed presence method performs pretty close to the fixed count method. We can't really tell those apart. The time presence method offers the potential to include O over E indices for diatoms in assessment. And finally, the time presence method also allows estimates of loss of biodiversity, which have not been possible up to this point for um, lodic species, that is in, in rivers and streams. So like a, so like a fixed count, the time presence method captures the most abundant taxa these over here with a lot of individuals. And in addition, the time presence method is better at getting these taxa. And this, these taxa appear to be what is responsible for making this O over E model successful. So what's next? We need verification. This proposed enumeration method is faster, it provides estimates of dominant taxa, includes characterization of species richness, and it could offer an improvement over the current methods. The method, however, needs to be verified because all that we've presented here are from this single study in the Southeast. So we propose that, um, we could apply the time presence method to a selected group of the hundreds now, hundreds of EPA and USGS sites that have been analyzed using a voucher flora. 
So we've got the 600 valve counts and we could easily fold in a timed presence method that allows us to have a side-by-side -side comparison um, to really feel confident in adopting a new approach. So um, I'd like to acknowledge our funding from the U.S. Geological Survey and a cooperative agreement with the University of Colorado. And thanks to students, technicians, visitors, friends of the Instar Diatom Lab for really conversation, good conversation, inspiration, and great collaboration and fun. So with that, I will end and I would be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was a wonderful talk. And I want to thank you for um, doing this kind of research. I know it can be um, difficult to pose, um, you know, questions about methods that are used by so many for so long. Um, but I think it's important that we, you know, keep trying to improve efficiency and um, learn more new things about diatoms and assessment. So thank you. All right, we have questions. Uh, Mark asks, how quickly do analysts adapt to the new methods for counting? Does it involve additional training? Um, I think, you know, you know I've, I've mentioned that these are dependent upon having a voucher flora. So um, we haven't tried that at how people adapt to this. Um, it, it's kind of an expansion of using a voucher flora that people are working from a set of taxa and, um, and, and recording them, you know, what they have in the voucher flora. And if there are new things, um, capturing those and adding them to the existing voucher flora. I would say, um, you know, it might be uh, in terms of additional training, uh, maybe a great approach to be able to do this would be what we've done with a lot, which is to workshop it, to get people together and say, okay, we're all gonna do this uh, method right here, have at it and let's see what happens. You know, where do you get hung up? What are the problems? How does it, uh, what happens in the translation? Thank you. We have a question from Clint. Has the larger verification study been started? Any idea when we could see results of a larger <laughs> data set? <laughs> Thanks, Clint. Um, no, I, I am proposing it right here on the spot. <laughs> I, I propose to do that and, and I, you know, I need some support from my agency and from you to say this would be a good idea and you got and and we need to do it all right we have a question from maria um sarah great presentation um in case there is no voucher flora for a region would that be the first step um, and then try to find the best enumeration method well Actually, I'd say go back a little bit. Um, first step is what's the, the problem you're trying to solve? What's the question you need to answer? Um, is it you know, for your survey? Um, and it may, you know, maybe you don't need to count all the diatoms. It, you know, it really depends. If you are, say you want to build a, a, a multi-metric index, um, I would say, yes, develop a voucher flora for your region so you document the species that are there um, with images from what's in your region and, and can verify the names that you apply to them. Question from Magdalena. Um, how can the experience of analysts alter the results of, obtained in the time presence method? Good question. I don't. I don't know. I think um, experience probably is pretty crucial in in this method. That um, 
analysts need to have have looked at a lot of diatoms um, and and be able to kind of know what they're looking at and know when they need to look more to may, say make an identification like you find something in a in a girdle view you you would need to say look more and find that thing in order to um, make an an identification do you think that analysis that Meredith did with taking random uh, species, number of species out, gives us a clue about um, experience? Um, if you are less experienced, you might count fewer species. Oh, I see. You wouldn't recognize them as being distinct. Um, potentially, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Because um, that's a good question. Yeah, if if someone has less like they experience, yeah, they might they might not encounter or be able to identify as many as an experienced taxonomist. Right. But I think a voucher flora could be really helpful there. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. A question from Edna. Can the results of this counting method be used to compare results from other studies with the traditional method? And is there a way to make a standardization with other studies? Uh, good question. Um, they, the, the data structure is different um, in these. And I think that's one reason why there's some, at least even within my own agency, there's a real he hesitancy to say, um, yeah, we're going to change methods because how do we then use our last 30 years of data? Um, they're, they're, they're going to be different. The, the, the fixed count captures the abundant taxa and it misses the other so that you get a you know, fundamentally different uh, view of, of what species are there. You still get the most dominant taxa, but um, there would not be, you would not be able to compare those data sets directly. We need to do more to say, um, if they were turned into metrics, our work shows that that uh, seems to be compatible. If your interest is, is looking at metrics, that seemed to be to match up between the um, fixed count and the time presence. Um, if, but if you were looking at um, something other, like, you know, sort of like an ordination or a, um, or species curves, it would be, it would look very different. Here's a question from Melissa. Are metrics run differently on the timed presence counts? For example, are rare taxa counted as one, or is it similar to presence absence data? It's, uh, yeah, good question. The, they are um, counted as presence absence data. How does that um, kind of meld with the 100 species um, taxa or 100 valves that you count in the first part of timed presence. Are those turned into time uh, presence absence as well? You know, I, I, I actually don't know about what exactly Meredith did on that. Good question. I, I'm going to have to look and see if they were. Um, I'm pretty sure that we that it's a it's a um, presence absence measure. But, um, I can look it up and get back to you. <laughs> yeah. I was also curious um, for the stratified counting method. Um, you said that it would take a long time to um, get to 50 taxa in, uh, it was low diversity samples. Would it be possible to try that with less than 50? Or would that mean we don't capture enough diversity? No, that's a great question. You can set any, any end, end point. Um, and, the, you, and I think part of the trick of uh, working with these is to 
um, kind of understand how different uh, assemblages uh, respond. You know, um, so those um, that mark of, of 50 was selected because it's like that's definitely going to give us the the dominant tax. Uh, you could argue and test that by the time you you say get 20 taxa in a sample you have characterized their error pretty well and you can measure what that error is um, in in any sample um, like i need you know with 50 taxa my error is like um, you know 20 percent with uh, 20 maybe it's like 60%, you know, so there's a kind of a trade off between how well you um, capture those. But that's a really, that's a really interesting question. And um, I, I used a stratified count in my own um, dissertation work. And um, I used a higher number there of, um, did I, of 100? I don't know, pick something. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We we did some neat, you know, David will remember we did this neat uh, exercise with the class in Iowa of doing a stratified count against a fixed count, um, split the class into two and had one half the class analyze a sample um, using a fixed count and the other half using a stratified count. Um, and um, we should revive those, David, um, because that's a. It was one of the things that like set set me off in thinking about this more, um, because you can play with those and get to know like based on these curves how how well do we count, and in our uh, software that we you know, actually just sell spreadsheet, as we count, we look continuously at, at that um, efficiency curve. So you can know for any sample, like how well is this capturing um, either the, the efficiency um, or how, so you, so you could do it that way. There are a number of different endpoints. So this standardization is something that you need to work at. Yeah. Another question from uh, Josh, um, he, wants to ask you about O over E models and the reference sites. Um, how do you know what the reference should be for a particular set of sites? Yeah, now that is a question that um, has been argued around the block for 20 years, I think, by um, you know, people within EPA and, and USGS and and Chuck Hawkins, who's really been the uh, promoter of O over E models. And there are um, various ways that uh, reference sites are determined. Um, one way is kind of a, a, a top down geographic analysis looking at everything that is, um, uh, you know, looking for watersheds in particular that have, um, you know, no, you know, minimal amount of roads, minimal amount of agriculture, minimal of forestry, and selecting sites based on that. Other ways are um, having thresholds in terms of chemistry of, um, you know, if some, if the watershed has a certain amount of phosphorus or nitrogen, depending on the region, it's not going to be a reference site or even a combination of all those. But even beyond that, there are many regions of the country that we could say uh, rivers have been altered extensively and the best that is possible is a least impacted site. So um, those are, um, there, there are, there's a lot of publications about reference sites and um, how they're, they're um, determined. So, and this is following on, along with the USGS kind of top-down uh, GIS uh, survey of watersheds. And, you know, we're gonna go to those because they're the least impacted at this elevation. 
In the example that you showed, um, you used percent imperviousness as the gradient um, where you tested the over E models. Um, what if you were interested in another gradient? Would you have to um, you know, go back and uh, do a classification study of your sites to pick reference? No, well, okay, so say you're interested in uh, um, nutrient gradient in this same region of the Southeast, um, you could use all the same reference sites and data, uh, but you would say want to go select sites that cover a nutrient gradient. Mm -hmm. So you go from, um, you know, a range of being impacted um, by uh, confined animal feeding operations or something or or agriculture so that you get those um, get that gradient of test sites um, but you could use the you know these um, results and these this voucher flora to construct that um, for such a, a, a nutrient gradient David makes a point here that um, for lake systems, you can use paleolimnology to infer the historical or na natural conditions as your reference. Exactly. You know, this came about because there, um, it, when uh, people started looking at streams and rivers and wanting to uh, be able to say, you know, what has changed, you don't have a paleo record. And this is a way to infer a reference state where we don't have a sediment record. Mark asks, do you have a specific counting program that you use in your lab? Um, we, it's not a specific program. It's really, I'm really a, a Excel spreadsheet that has a, you know, a little doodad that keeps track of the number of taxa encountered and you know and continuously draws that curve so you can see at any point what is the count efficiency of that sample and um, i'm glad to share that if anyone wants to use that um, that excel spreadsheet um, great nothing fancy <laughs> um, I was curious, um, you mentioned that the academy would, in addition to the traditional fixed counts, um, they would continue looking through the slide for large and rare species. Um, what is it about the large taxa that it's hard to encounter them in samples? Is it just because they're also rare? Um, yeah, they tend, large taxa tend to be rare. And um, when there are a, a lot of, say, agnanthidium, you might run up against your 600 valve count and never see the didymosphenia that's in the sample. And that's exactly the issue that we had with, um, with didymosphenia is that, um, you know, something like half of the samples analyzed by a fixed count don't encounter didymosphenia even within a bloom because the analyst this doesn't it, it's, or you get to the 600 valve count before you see it there's because there's so many small things mm -hmm. when you showed that graph of the enumeration efficiency are those the same as rare fraction curves um, they're related. So rarefaction is a technique by which people can um, look at numbers of species and equalize them across samples. It doesn't, uh, rarefaction doesn't account for the identity of the species. So that's one of the differences. So, um, uh, so say, um, you had a, a survey and you counted 600 valves and I had a survey and I counted 300 valves in my survey and we wanted to compare our data set. We would use rarefaction as a technique to subsample 
from your 600 valve count to back it off to be equal to a 300 count. So you randomly remove individuals and so it looks like a 300 count. Um, so it's a way of sort of like uh, down sampling the data so that they can be con uh, compared. Um, but you can't really turn it around the other way and you can't really see the taxa that you're missing. Thanks for that question. Well, um, we are almost at the top of the hour. I think uh, we had really great questions and a chance for discussion. Um, and uh, I wanna probably stop here um, just due to time. Um, I wanna thank our presenter, Sarah Spaulding again, and everyone for joining us today. Um, at the uh, end of the month, we'll have another um, presentation. We're looking forward to uh, Maria Kellert. She'll be presenting um, about intercalibration harmonization in the Nordic Baltic network. And also wanted to let everyone know um, that on the Diatoms of North America website, diatoms.org, you will be able to um, access our um, list of upcoming webinar speakers, um, as well as the archive of all the Web Academy uh, presentations. And we now have our own YouTube uh, playlist. So you'll be able to have all those webinars in one spot. So again, thanks everybody. Um, really great to see everyone. And David just put the link in the chat for the playlist. Thank you, David. And we will see you again soon. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you everyone. Take care. Bye. <laughs>